Revolutionary greetings, folks. This is Victor Coronado alongside Nick Ayala. We are Anti-Conquista. Thank you for tuning in. Please check us out at anticonquista.com. Please like, please share, please subscribe. Uh, we are on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. We are on Twitter, so on and so forth. Um, hope everybody is uh, doing all right. Comrade Nick Ayala, how we doing? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? Good, good, good. This is Nuestra America. Um, this is a weekly program where we bring, bring to you uh, different news and events that are happening uh, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, this is episode nine of Nuestra America, and we titled this episode White Saviors and Latin America Profiting from Humanitarianism. Uh, Nick, let's start there first before we get into the headlines and, and some of the news. Um, so uh, your, your thoughts on this on this topic? Uh, well, when we think a lot about this topic, um, I guess specifically when we were speaking about it, uh, we were thinking about NGOs and that kind of NGO savior uh, uh, industrial complex that uh, oftentimes plays out in many of our um, in many of our countries, not just in Latin America, but throughout throughout the world, as we've seen. Um, and we know you've, we've seen NGOs play a, a kind of vital role uh, specifically in anti-imperialist you know, nations, socialist nations, playing a role where essentially they are almost, they are opposed to all kinds of policies, usually people's policies. And we saw this a lot with Evo Morales in Bolivia. We've seen this with Maduro. And we see this, seen this most recently in, uh, in Cuba. So, you know, this is really what we're talking about when we talk about these kind of white savior uh, complexes, these industries and these organizations, which go into our nations on the auspices of, you know, being progressive, being liberal, um, but really are, are, try, are just doing the work of the imperialists. And we'll get into more specific examples, I think, in, in a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, for there's, there's one specific place folks can look to, um, where you, you see, uh, you know, this take, uh, an interesting uh, role. Um, is um, Venezuela. Now, we, we've, uh, we have mentioned uh, Evan Gollinger here in the past. I, for, I, I don't know where she stands now on, on Venezuela. I don't believe she uh, considers herself so anymore a, a Chavista. I'm not 100% sure. You know, folks can, can fact check me on that. Um, but she, uh, she did, write, uh, she did uh, uh, write a few books on the topic um, when she was an adamant supporter. Uh, and she, uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, through uh, uh, through FOIA, uh, she was able to um, uncover many, uh, uh, you know, government documents that that showed uh, the links between, um, you know, a lot of these um, uh, these so-called uh, pro-democracy, um, you know, opposition groups and leaders and these NGOs and specifically USAID and NED. Um, and she not only, again, not, not only does she provide this information in her book, but then she provides the actual documents them, themselves where you see a lot of redacted uh, information. Um, you know, so while, you know, a lot of these documents were handed over to her, there's a lot of stuff in there that's, that's also redacted, but um, you know, and then, you know, towards the end of, of one of these books and I, you know, again, you folks can check, check these books out online. Um, towards the end of uh, one of these books, like literally she, she kind of uh, gives a graph like uh, of showing the links. Uh, and so you can't really, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to really take these opposition, quote unquote, opposition leaders um, who take this, this money, uh, whether it be in Cuba or Nicaragua or Venezuela or anywhere else, it's hard to take these folks seriously. Um, you know, because there's there's clearly an agenda there. There, and then again, just to sort of, just to be able to conceptualize some of this stuff um, and look at it from a different angle. Just imagine if the Cuban Revolution or the Chavistas or the Sandinistas were setting up all types of you know uh, you know NGOs and organizations here in the United States with really the explicit intent of like promoting regime change, right? Um, which creates all sorts of problems because then, you know, uh, 
I mean, those types of things could lead to a civil war, which which we've seen in these places. We've seen, you know, uh, violence break out in all these in all these places, in Cuba and Venezuela and, and Bolivia and, uh, and Nicaragua. I mean, there, there's a reason why this stuff happens. Um, and so when we say profiting from humanitarianism, yeah, there are people, there are individuals within these organizations that are profiting. But also, you know, another way to look at it is, again, in, the, why, why, why does imperialism uh, place so much stake in these organizations? It's because the empire itself is looking to profit from these uh um you know from these from these from these projects um that they're promoting in in all these uh in all these countries um so uh so yeah i mean i'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll turn it over to you now but that those are just some my some my, some of my thoughts on 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 that yeah no i mean i, I think you're you're right and, and too it's it's the individuals who are profiting off oftentimes are the ones who are uh in charge of these organizations right who are at the head of these organizations and, and, you know, a lot of these organizations tend to be um, European or, or uh, American organizations. We were talking about this before. Uh, a, a clear example is, you know, the what happened in Bolivia with the TIP and IS project, which, you know, we were again, we were talking about this uh, a project, I think, back in 2012 or uh, 2013, um, where essentially they were going to build a, a, a highway through uh this, I think southern Bolivia, and, and it would have to, it would go through part of an indigenous community. So a lot of NGOs, specifically Danish, European, and uh, I think a couple American NGOs, were working with the indigenous community to bring up this to kind of fight back against uh, the pol the government policy of building this highway. But it would have been really beneficial to essentially the entire country, but specifically the local community and a lot of the campesino farmers. Um, and so. You know what the NGOs did was they took a, a, a pro people policy, a policy that would have uh, a infrastructure policy that would have benefited a lot of the local farmers, and they used um, a kind of like a, a progressive, if you want to call it like an identity politics struggle to undermine um, this beneficial program. And this is something that you know I think is going to be more popular. Uh, it's already is already more popular, but it's going to be more so the the main. Um, fight against a lot of these anti-imperialist, anti-U.S. Uh, imperialist, uh, uh, you know, sovereign nations. Um, I just think back to when was it, 2018, when they tried to push that humanitarian aid through uh, through into Venezuela, and you had a coalition of NGOs uh, of of like straight up government forces, billionaires, um, musicians, celebrities. That was a coalition of all types of extremely wealthy individuals profiting off of a, a, a false flag, you know, fake humanitarian aid operation. That, that I just remember getting into a ton of arguments with folks because the, that was on, on display, right. For the whole right. world to see. And all the capitalist press was just playing that left and right, not just in, in English speaking uh, media, capitalist media, but in Spanish speaking capitalist media. And, and everyone, you know, a, a lot of folks here that I, that I would, that I was talking to, family members, friends, you know, immediately the narrative is like, Maduro is just evil, you know, yeah. Maduro's just evil. And, and I'm, I'm there trying to educate people on, on who Elia Abrams is right. um, and trying to explain like, this is not the first time that Elia Abrams tries to pull some shit off like this. So it's not. And then, and then what did we find out years later? Right. The whole right. thing was just bullshit. Right. 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 So, so yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's a, that's a great, that's an excellent point right there. I just, <laughs> um, the, the hum, humanitarian aid will, uh, is, is something that is used as, as a mask, uh, to, for, for something else. Right. And that, that was a, that was right there, a whole Trojan war, uh, uh horse uh, thing happening right before our eyes and people buy into that shit. Mm -hmm. Think about it, man. You had Richard Branson. Uh, English, he, he's from the UK, right? He's he's not even American. So you, so you had an English billionaire going to Venezuela as if he cares about, or going to Colombia, not even Venezuela, as if he cares about human rights for Venezuelans. Like it, it, it's it's so fake, and you know it, and it's like um like very in your face. It's very explicit, but it's crazy too because it's very powerful. Like you said, a lot of our a lot of uh, Latinos throughout not just the diaspora, but also in Latin America, we're, we're convinced that, you know, uh, the Venezuelans are suffering so much. They need this aid. Um, and you saw Maduro, just like, just like uh, Evo Morales did in, in Bolivia back in 2013, 
Maduro, uh, you know, refused to take the aid and right, you know, legitimately so it, it made sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I just not, not to belabor it, but just, I just, um, I just remember that happening and it was, it was such a, it was a, it was a, it was a big moment in the Latino community here in the United States. Cause a lot of people were talking about that. Yeah. And just like how you see, you know, if, if you can go back, remember when that was going down, this was clearly, clearly a U.S. orchestrated thing that was on full display, very much, very similar to the July 11 event, events, where it was like the people were just pumping this up and pumping this up. And it was like, oh, here it is. This is the counter revolution. It's coming. And that's it. The Maduro regime is done. Right. And it was just, it was all, and then you throw the humanitarian aid in there. It's just, um, it's pretty, it's disgusting, you know, because, um, you know, obvious for the obvious reasons, but then, you know, when our people fall into the, that, that's, that's the worst part is when you have to sit there and actually, actually educate people on some of the history, um, which I don't mind doing. It's just, it, but it's, you know, I got into a lot of, you know, contentious debates within my family and friends, um, you know, because again, that's, it wasn't just in the in the English speaking media. It was it was they were targeting Latinos specifically to try to build support in America. Uh, they they understand there's 60 million of us here, right? So the, any, anytime you can get Latinos on board, it makes it easier. Right, and we saw the same thing too with the July, uh, July 11th event. We did that um, uh, against that guy uh, uh, Paparazzi. Uh, right. We did that that whole post, and you know it, it connected him back to uh, uh, an NGO, uh, an NGO based out of Spain. Uh, created by two right wing uh, gusanos, so it, I, I forget. I think it's what Cyber Cuba or something like that. But it's those types of organizations. You know, they're they're targeting uh, our our population. They're targeting our people, uh, and specifically Spanish speaking folks. So probably you know, uh, middle aged or even older folks, right? And they're going after going after these sort of socialist um, talking points, like these these generalizations attacking socialism conflating socialism with anything that the government does and stuff like that. So, you know, these, these NGOs are, are very prevalent. I think with the Venezuelan example too, one thing to keep in mind is that was very, um, it's very explicit. Like the U S I remember when that was going on, it was like the U S was proud to be taking credit for it to some extent, you know? And it, it, one thing I think that also needs to be acknowledged is that a lot of these NGOs aren't always that explicit. A lot of them are working within the countries for like five, 10, 15 years, building up that force, building up those bases. And then, you know, that kind of uh, ultimately ends up in like one big event, a coup or some sort of attack against the government if it's an anti-U.S. government. Um, so, you know, some of the things, too, are, are, are more subtle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So when what was it? I think it was 2013. Um, I've mentioned this before in a, in a prior pro, uh, program, you know, I was out in the Dominican Republic, um, and I had interviewed the, the Venezuelan ambassador to the Dominican Republic. Um, and we were talking about where, where, where were these people, you know, these quote unquote democracy protesters, uh, remember, remember they were barricading themselves in middle-class communities. Uh, and you had student quote unquote student protesters. Well, guess what? A lot of those student protesters were receiving uh, USAID money, you know, um, and, and again, this is stuff that's on record, you know, and it's it's it just again, it just speaks to um, a lot of, you know, I, again, we, we, we know that the, the U.S. empire, it just never stops. It just never stops. But, um, you know, it, it just speaks to a larger issue about why do why do we even allow you know, these organizations to exist in, in our respective, you know, motherlands in the first place, uh, which it, it's going to, it's going to lead into uh, something I'm going to talk about one of the headlines, which uh, we'll talk about what happened in Nicaragua and good for, for Nicaragua. But that's a whole, that's a whole nother, you know, uh, um, issue is it's not, not only are they, do they exist, but how do you get rid of these people? Um, you know, even, even something like human rights watch, right? Like right. human rights watch is a, is a quote unquote liberal organization. Then they some somehow get to determine a lot of the narratives of, you know, what should be done in our countries, right? Because they're trying to impose, they're, they're another arm for, for empire. They're just another imperial arm where they go and they, and they're essentially imposing their Western liberal democracy on our people. Like, so if we don't, if we don't fit, 
that particular model that, you know, whatever model that they're prescribing for us, then, you know, we're evil. Uh, you know, and, 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 and they have a nice, they have a great name too, right? Human rights watch. It's like, oh man, these guys, these people are definitely for human rights, you know? Right. And, and a lot of the times too, I see a lot of uh, young, younger folks, I guess, who are maybe more liberal or um, even sometimes progressive who follow these organizations, uh, large ones like human rights watch, or even like the red cross and, and they, they actually, or even M like, places like Amnesty International, they follow these NGOs and these organizations and they, um, you know, take at face value everything that they say as if it's true. Um, and that's kind of, I think, one of the, the marketing, the advertising goals is to draw in young people who uh, consider themselves, you know, social activists or consider themselves, uh, uh, you know, people who care about social justice or doing something good in the world. And they divert that energy into fighting for the empire fighting for imperialism without them even always being aware um i you know i remember uh interesting experience i had and this is a little bit off topic but when i when i was in vietnam we we ended up meeting and speaking with the ngo that focused on anti-poaching um and, and it's it's complicated because a lot of the poaching uh is done by folks who are oftentimes you know extremely poor right but and, and a lot of the times they wouldn't actually be able to draw back to the source of where uh, the poaching came from. So they would be going after those who are like selling products that were made from poached materials. And oftentimes these, these would be like very poor, just, just folks who are trying to uh, scrape by and make anything that they can. So this NGO was attacking, you know, some of the poorest in society, those who are just selling the products uh, in, in an attempt to kind of do this green, revolution you know purify the, the the purify vietnam purify the 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 poaching trade and it was it was kind of disturbing to me because it was like you guys aren't really you guys aren't really helping the community or helping society you're, you're you're attacking people who are in poverty um and people who are just doing whatever they can to try to you know to try to survive um but that's in my i remember seeing that and i'm like well this is what ngos are this is like the white savior complex right. um but in an, in an industrialized and institutionalized way. Right. It's really, it's really, it's, again, it's another act of war. It's, it's just another way to uh, uh, wage war against, against our nations. I, 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 it, it, it pains me to say this, but it's the truth, you know, cause I know some folks, um, you know, who consider themselves progressives and whatnot. Um, you know, Konai has, has been mentioned, C-O-N-A-I-E, uh, has been mentioned uh, a lot by a lot of progressives and and whatnot, but they they've also received uh, I, I forget if it was whether it was either USAID or NED, um, and we were mentioning off air how you know they were they were there was a split right um, you know in terms of who to support um, for the presidential elections in in Ecuador. Well, why is that? Right? I mean, when, when you receive. <laughs> You know, it, and so look, I mean, think about that for a second, you know, so, so now you have, you know, this money going into, into indigenous communities to try to confuse folks or sway them a certain, a certain way. And they're, they're voting against their own interests. Now I know, look, I get it. I know that the, the that there's also, uh, in Ecuador, you had, um, you had certain contradictions there between the indigenous community and, uh, Korea's um, a government, without question. I'm not going to dismiss that. I don't want to be dismissive, but would those contradictions would have would they have escalated to the point that they did um, if um, if the, the the money wasn't there, right? So, like, you have to ask yourself those because that that's a that's a that's a um, you know that's a that's a good question to ask. It's a it's a fair question to ask, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean. You know, it's um, this this whole this whole issue. We, we've done pretty much two two programs on on this now. So you know, sort of with the same theme, and it's it's problematic. It's we our people can do okay uh, for themselves. We don't need NGOs. We don't need European and American organizations, uh, whether they're state sponsored or not, in our countries. We really don't. Now, if you know uh, some of these these governments. Are, are asking for help and someone's willing to provide the help and there's mutual terms, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. 
But this idea that all these NGOs and these European and American NGOs know what's best for us and then start writing reports and claims and making claims and, um, you know, about our people and back, back, we don't, we don't need that. Like that doesn't, none of these countries do it to America. So why, 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 why is it acceptable for Latin Americans and Caribbeans, uh, Caribbean folks to allow these NGOs and, um, you know, um, uh, these actors to to be to be in, in our respective motherlands for for what they don't need they don't need to be there right and and, and just on konai too think about the the split that it caused i remember ha half of the organization or one of the the, uh, the leaders i forget uh i think it was the old uh, uh, the former president was at um you know was was at uh uh, uh morales is uh, the mas party's rallies right he was there when they were uh bringing uh when they were I think it was when they were, when they came back into power after the coup, right? Um, so on one hand you have Konai supporting Moss, and then on the other hand you have them supporting Yaku Perez, and it seems it's it's the split and the contradictions come from like you said that injection of of USAID that that you know NGO money, um, which also kind of acts as a divide and conquer tactic, right? Because look at look at the populations that they're targeting in in Latin America and even here in the U.S. Um, they're targeting you know, populations like the indigenous population in Cuba, we saw them targeting the, the African, the, the, uh, you know, Afro Cuban or, or the black population and the hip hop community and the hip hop. Community, right. And they do that oftentimes with women. And all we need to do is go to the middle East to see how these NGOs operate the exact same way, but, you know, instead using, uh, or going after women, especially in Arab countries or in Muslim countries. Um, that's something that even that dates back to the fifties with you know, friends. Fanon talks about that. Um, but the, that's part of the NGO tactic in these in these white savior complex is really what they're saying is, you know, through our money, through our investments, we'll do better. Uh, we'll be able to provide more for you than your own country or your own people or your own communities can. Um, and it's, you know, the, the there is, too. It's not just that complex of believing that you can come in and, and save a whole a whole nation or a whole community, but. There's also the fact that they're profiting off of the exploitation and the oppression and the poor conditions that a lot of folks are living in. And you don't have to look any further than Haiti to see how many NGOs have profited off of. If you look at if you just look up uh, uh, Haiti NGOs and you, and you look up the, the you see the maps of how many NGOs are in Haiti, it's it's insane. Right. And then to think that the conditions have never haven't really improved, given, you know, hundreds, thousands of NGOs have entered the country. Uh, it's profiting off of the the complete destruction exploitation and oppression of our people the impoverishment of our people ngos and um and not quote unquote non-for-profit organizations not only are they problematic in latin america but they're also problematic here in the united states as well um, um so you and i nick you and i are from new jersey there's an organization <clears throat> um titled new brunswick tomorrow in in uh, the city of New Brunswick, uh, for folks you know who are not familiar with the city of New Brunswick, that's where Rutgers University is basically located. You have uh, a few hospitals, uh, very uh, prestigious hospitals there. Um, so you got the university there, um, and it's uh, overwhelmingly a, la a Latino community, um, poor working class community, um, and. The executive director there at New Brunswick Tomorrow, uh, the former, the, the exa I don't know what the current one is is is, is making, but the former uh, executive director there was making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Um, he need he need in order for him to make that money, he needs poverty to exist, you know, and and non for profit organizations, anyone who's who's ever worked for one. Um, especially if with, with that has like a social justice bent to it, it's interesting. It's just very interesting because unless you have a political action committee that's tied to that, and even that again, it's very problematic. These these uh you know four hundred one c three, that's what they're called. For you know that's how the the, the legal name is the four hundred one c three non for profit organizations. By nature, you can't. They, they're not allowed to be political. It's not. They're not allowed to be political. So. This proliferation of, of NGOs and non for profits in the United States is so problematic from a from a when you talk about political self determination. So a lot of these social justice activists, um, you know, get involved in these non for that's not the revolution. 
and and if you notice in Latin America, we don't have too many of those. The ones that we do have, we're talking about it now. They're 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 problematic as well. But in Latin America, you don't have that. And what do you have? You have people fighting um, for um, you know for socialism, for for a change, a transformational change, right? People are fighting for that because you don't have all these non for profits. And even when you do have them, again, they're problematic. And here in the United States, we have a proliferation of them. It's crazy how many non for profits exist. And people think that that's the revolution. No, they get you caught up in this in the in the game of uh, one issue being a one issue based organization. So you fight for that one issue, whatever that issue is: prison reform, uh, climate change. Um, you know, uh, you name you name it. You know, uh, uh, they're gonna get you caught up in this one one issue, and then there and there's there's strings attached to the funding that you receive. I mean, the whole thing is ext extremely problematic. And it doesn't get us to the space of where we're fighting for political self-determination. So, um, yeah, I just want to kind of throw that angle in there as well that, you know, this and, and and by the way, same same thing, too, with the white savior complex. Most of these NGOs are driven by are, are, are ran by white folks with white money attached to it. You know, yeah. um, I I had a, a brief, 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 brief stint at the a, uh, ACLU. And I was like their token radical revolutionary, you know, Latin guy, you know, whatever. I had to get out. I, I, after a month, I was out. I was. I had to get the fuck out. Um, and they had to actually get. I levied a bunch of criticisms as to why I left, and they had to get the the um, someone from the AFL, the ACLU, Puerto Rico, to do my exit interview. And when I gave him, you know, the responses and he said, he said, look, I, I've been telling those folks up there for years, like, you know, you, you can't, you got to listen to our people and you got to like put, put our people at the table. When I went to one of their board meetings, not one single Latino at the S at ACLU, not one. How you, and they're, by the way, here's the irony about the whole, their whole pro 90% of their quote unquote program at the time was on racial justice. So how the fuck your whole program going to be about, about racial justice in the state of New Jersey and you don't have one Latino on your board and you had me as your, your Latino employee who basically I was like your token. You know, this is just a microcosm of the shit that you see everywhere else because I've talked to other activists and other people and, and I'm like, yo, we got to get ourselves away from this shit, man. Like this is not the rev. That's not the revolution, bro. Right. But they're really good at, at marketing. Not even as revolution, like you said, they, they usually focus on single issue topics and they're good at marketing towards people who who, you know, care. I want to say like a lot of folks who have good hearts and want to do something, um, you know, good for their communities or whatever. And they, they target that audience. Right. And they, they bring them into this. And then once you kind of get sucked in, you know, you it becomes like a career. You get job, you get comfortable. And that's really what the whole part of the process. It's a it's a. It's a good process to really like stunt revolutionary growth or even just radic like radicalizing uh, individuals to look at more systemic issues, right? Um, but now nah, you're you're 100 right, 100 correct. It's for careerists, for people who right. are not willing to 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 make sacrifices and um, be about real transformational change, you know. And I mean, we could have we should have a whole other conversation about that because I I've, I have certain you know. The left sucks here in the United States. I'm sorry. It, we we can't think about what's happening all over Latin America. We can't we can't figure out. You know, there's 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 two ways. The whole goal is to take take state power. Like that should be the goal for leftists, right? Is you to take the state power. So how do you do that? There's only two ways you do that. That's uh, through violence. And just to be clear, just in case of the state security forces are listening, I'm not advocating for violence. <laughs> but but there's through one is through violence. And through and to a possible way, and it's not ideal, right, is through the electoral process. And the entire left is so fractured because we everybody wants to pump. And, and I'm I'll I'll be I'll I'll raise my hand and say I, I've been guilty of this, too, that we want to pump our chests because we're we have the bet. We have the correct ideological line and we're more revolutionary than you. But we but we don't know how to create strategic alliances. And, and win elections. So those are your two options. It's violence or um, the electoral process. Latin America is figuring out, figuring it out little by little, little on how to figure on how to win 
this, you know, w- win through or take over state power through the electoral process, understanding that that the bourgeoisie is still in, in charge of of different state institutions. So that's just that's another part. So it's not enough just to win an election. That's just a small part, right? Um, but yeah, the the you know it's it's not getting back to the theme. You know, NGOs, non for profits. That's not that's not where it's at. It's it's problematic to say the least. It's dangerous to to be be really honest, to be brutally honest. They're very they're dangerous and they're 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 antithetical to to re, to to revolutionary movements and and to revolution. Uh, this idea of revolution. They're antithetical. They're not they're not they should not they really don't have a any significant role. It's the opposite. They they impede revolutionary activity. Right. And I think it's a good segue to um because a lot of these, a lot of these NGOs will will talk about, you know, the need for certain policies or for certain governments to act. Oftentimes, they're the ones who are calling for intervention, um, or at least calling for, you know, providing that justification for interventions. Um, and I think Haiti is a good example uh, of of how these NGOs are doing this. And what we've seen recently, just to segue into some of the headlines with the um, 200 U.S. troops who were recently sent into Haiti in order to basically do that humanitarian assistance or to provide that that aid. Um, and, you know, the, the problem isn't so much that, you know, the issue isn't that, that whether or not the troops are actually going to provide humanitarian assistance or not. The issue is that the uh, uh, history and the legacy of international aid in Haiti is a, a, is a traumatic history, is an oppressive history, right? And it's not, it's not one that was that, that long ago, right? And so the trust isn't there for the U.S. or for the U.N. or for any of these international organizations like the Red Cross to actually go in there and provide a, a decent help to these communities because that's probably that's most likely not what they're going to do, right? Uh, especially considering you know you're sending 200 only 200 U.S. troops uh, to help thousands of folks who have been who have been injured. The one question should be well, why troops and why not you know doctors? Why not me- medical supplies? Why not uh, engineers, what? Which is what uh, Cuba is doing, right? Which is exactly what, and that's the thing. It's not Cuba, Mexico, Chile. All these other Latin American countries have come out first before any of the superpowers. They didn't send their militaries, right? They're sending supplies. They're sending goods. They're sending things that that the Haitian government could actually use, right? The Haitian people could actually use. Um, and the U.S. and many of these, and and the U.N. You know, their suggestion is peacekeeping forces. Uh, uh, military forces, you know, it clearly not within the interest of any anyone from the community. There. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> before we get to the headlines, anything else um, you want to bring up about this topic of again white savior? This is episode nine of Nuestra America um, over here, anti conquista. Um, topic is white saviors in Latin America profiting from human humanitarianism. No, I mean, I don't have anything else to to add. I think, you know, we touched on most of it and uh, we could probably go into the headline about Nicaragua because that has a lot to do with what. um, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Before I do, I did want to mention that comrade Carlos, who was not able to uh, be with us today, did want me to mention uh, two studies and and, uh, he was going off the top of his head. So we apologize if we didn't get the the dates correct, but um, I'm pretty sure you could find that on, you know, uh, on the Internet. Um, you folks can research, uh, and this is specifically about this topic of, uh, of, uh, again, NGOs in, in Latin America, the EU and Colombia and Peru, um, this study done by Amanda Latimer, uh, and he believes it was done in 2011. And then in, uh, J- uh 1999, another study by James Petras, uh, again, NGOs in Latin America used for political and economic control. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, but getting now right into the headlines, we're going to start off with Nicaragua. Um, I have a few things here on Nicaragua. I, I see that the well, let me let me start off with this one. The Sandinista government canceled the registration of six NGOs based out of Denmark, Spain, the U.S. and Sweden. The government claims they are violating the country's transparency laws. I say good for them. <laughs> I mean, think about that right there. Denmark, Spain, U.S. and Sweden. Come on. now. Yeah, no, I mean that's and that's exactly what we we're talking about. Is exactly what uh, what Evo Morales did in in 2013. He's kick out these NGOs because they're the ones who are you know funding the opposition, 
They're the ones who are stirring up trouble. They're the ones who are supporting. And this isn't even the first time it happened in Nicaragua, right? Think of, what was it? What uh, 2018 when they had that that coup attempt and they're stashing the weapons in the churches? It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Yeah, and uh, I'm all for this. I think right. again, I um, it's simple. I I think anything American or European based that doesn't need to be in Latin America and the Caribbean. Though we we should we sh we have the right to just kick those motherfuckers out. Period. Just get out. We don't need you. Um, only on our terms. So, so yeah, I, I'm glad that I I read that and I was like, good. That's that's a that's a good thing. Right. Um, but here's to keep in mind that that now the the media is going to portray this as, or uh, you know, President Ortega is a, a shuts down human rights organizations. Or, right you know, represses so, so-and-so and so activists. Of course. Um, so that's, that's what's coming next. And, and in fact, that's, that, that, that's a perfect segue. Um, so the next four things I'm just going to bring up, I'm, these are just titles, uh, of, of, uh, of pieces folks can read. I'm noticing now a trend with the, the elections coming up. And of course, um, you know, the Sandinista government has taken certain actions to, to defend its sovereignty. There's a ratcheting up of these headlines, um, and so, and it's interesting where that's coming from. So, the Real Times uh, has a has a piece. Folks can look this up. It's titled "Only Armed Intervention Will Remove Ortega from Power," says exiled Nicaraguan opposition leaders. Um, a leader, Ariel Montoya, founder of the Nicaraguan Liberal Party and exiled in Miami, is calling for an armed intervention intervention to remove President Daniel Ortega from power. I mean, explicitly, like just saying there needs to be an intervention to remove this guy from power. So you have that at the real times. You have over at the Global Americans, the reasons the reasons behind Ortega and Murillo's Nicaragua crackdown. It's a very, it's a, I really encourage folks to read that piece. It's a, it's very skillfully written. It's devious. I mean, it's, it's it, with 100%, it's just, it's imperial propaganda, but it's very skillfully written. Um, and, uh, I really encourage folks to check that out. Um, because again, here's another yet, yet another piece, um, basically, um, you know, uh, doing the work of, of the empire, but it's, it's a very, it's a good piece in the sense that it's, it's so fucked up and it's so carefully and skillfully written that it just, you just, you know, you walk away saying, Hmm, okay, interesting. Like, you know, like th it's important to read what other people are writing, right? What, what, what the enemy is writing, what they're thinking. Um, here's another one. This one is just interesting. So uh, NACLA, which for a long time, you know, folks, you know, in the from the in progressive circles used to go to NACLA for, um, uh, for, for, um, you know, uh, for their source, you know, and for information on Latin America. They have a uh, a, a two part piece here written by William I. Robinson, um, and it's the first. It's a, the first part is called "Crisis in Nicaragua Is the or Ortega Murillo Government Leftist?" Right. So it's questioning the legit legitimacy. It's questioning their socialist credentials. Um, and then the second one, part two of that, "Crisis in Nicaragua Is the U.S. Trying to Overthrow the Ortega Murillo Government?" Um, again, it, it's these are very these these pieces are very skillfully you know uh, written. Um, they're. Um, William William Robinson is a, is a professor of sociology, global and Latin American studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he worked in Managua uh, with the Nicaragua News Agency and the Nicaragua Foreign Ministry in the 80s and was a affiliated of a faculty with the Central American University of Managua in 2001. So he, he gives those credentials, right, as someone who's like a legitimate, you know, a legitimate authority on, on, on Nicaragua. Now, folks can go back to the interview that we did what was now a few weeks ago with a, with an actual Sandinista living in Nicaragua, giving us a different version of what's happening in, in Nicaragua, right? Um, so again, I would, I would encourage folks to read it only just so you could study what's happening, right? So, so even, uh, even a, a publication like NACLA is, is now, you know, trying to get folks to fall for that okie doke. Right. And I think it's interesting because, you know, just talking about NGOs and nonprofits, usually when you have these or like uh, when you have like the Cubans who are, who are advocating for military intervention in, in Cuba or uh, Venezuelans who are doing the same, usually they're getting supported and funded by NGOs and nonprofits that exist here in the United States. 
that are specifically aimed at working in those communities. And, and you know, I, I always I always think it's funny that whenever there's some sort of conflict, um, the U.S. In, in the U.S., there's always a population from that country who's always there to advocate for military intervention. I was just watching on the news the other day. There was a uh, several protesters outside outside of white outside the White House, uh, uh, Af Afghans who were protesting the Taliban in in DC, and they were calling for U.S. military intervention to stop the the Taliban. Um, and so it's interesting because it's like it's always there's always at least one population or at least some part of the population who's there defending uh, a military intervention and how that you know where do they come from. Where does that, uh, uh, you know, funding? Where does that support come from? Oftentimes, it's from these, uh, uh, from imperialists, from usually from NGOs. Yeah, I want to very quickly before we move on to the next headline. This is, can you see that? Here we go. If you go to NACLA's website, right? It's n a c l a dot org. You, you click on the about us, who we are, who are we? Excuse me. The North American Congress on Latin America, or NACLA, is an independent, non-for-profit organization founded in 1966 that works towards a world in which the nations and peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean are free from oppression and injustice and enjoy a relationship with the United States based on mutual respect, free from economic and political sub, uh, subordination. To that end, our mission is to provide information and analysis on the region and on its complex and changing relationship with the United States as tools for e education and advocacy to foster knowledge beyond borders. I mean, that sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing, except when you realize that they're putting, uh, you know, imperialist propaganda on their on their um, on their website and 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 um, and selling it off to be, you know, to, as to be somehow progressive. You know, um, you know, it's just. This is exactly what we're talking about. Right. Um, lastly, there's a piece. Uh, again, this is just more, if you will, intel, right? Um, uh, Washington Post op-ed in Nicaragua. Uh, this is an op-ed uh, about Nicaragua. Um, it says here, in Nicaragua, night is falling for the free press. And again, it's a whole bunch of you know nonsense um, put out by the Washington Post. But you're going to see this start. Again, this we're, we're going to be ratcheting. I say we. The empire is going to be ratcheting it up, uh, ratcheting it up uh, as we as we inch closer to, to November, the November elections. Um, so there you have it on on, on Nicaragua. Uh, in Cuba, uh, again, very similar uh, to the propaganda you're you're seeing uh, about Nicaragua. Uh, there's a, there's a few pieces here. Uh, the country's main oxygen uh, plant broke down. Uh, because of this, President Miguel uh, Diaz Canel turned to the military to provide oxygen for COVID 19 stricken patients. And Chinese ambassador to Cuba, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Man Hui, uh, announced a few days on tw a few days ago on Twitter that China sent 150 oxygen concentrators to Cuba, and they arrived just a few days ago. Um, and then there's a piece by the New York Times: overwhelmed by coronavirus, Cuba's vaunted health healthcare system is reeling. Um, and, and again, you're, there's a bunch of articles now, you know, um, uh, pretty much now depicting the Cuban healthcare system as, as a failure, um, you know, and then, and, and, and people are now trying to, to highlight and take advantage of a little bit of a, a dialectical thing that's happening in Cuba where you've had, you know, Cuban, um, uh, uh, state, uh, officials say that, you know, they look, there've been some doctors who should probably, who could probably do more and, and provide better healthcare. And, you know, some of the healthcare uh, providers and professionals out there sort of, uh, you know, clap back, if you will, and say, Hey, you know, we, we, we're doing the best that we can so on and so forth. But you're seeing a lot of this propaganda, um, you know, taking advantage without mentioning without, or, or, or sort of tacitly mentioning, or just sort of glossing over just a little bit, you know, the, the real, the, what the real issue is, which is, again, there's a 60 plus year blockade and the United States continues to now that they've now it's been four, four rounds of sanctions now since the July 11th event, again, putting more pressure on Cuba, trying to asphyxiate Cuba even, even more. All right. And, and two, I, I don't think, you know, I was looking into the COVID situation in Latin America and Cuba is one of the most, uh, it has one of the highest vaccination rates uh, per 100 people in Latin America. I think like it's number three. 
Um, so, you know, they, they're vaccinating their population. They, they're, they're handling the, the, uh, the pandemic a lot better than most other countries. And it's interesting because just think back to like a few months ago before the whole, whole July 11 thing, it wasn't that long ago that, that the media, the Western media was praising Cuba for, you know, their, their handling of the pandemic. They were acknowledging that, you know, Cuban vaccines are actually effective or being proven effective. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's easy. It's just another thing. It's how easy it is to get the media like flipping a switch, right? Immediately they'll turn around and start attacking whoever they want or whoever the, the empire needs them to attack. But yeah, you know, Cuba's probably handling the pandemic better than most Latin American countries right now. Um, and it's their doctors who are being sent across the, the continent to actually provide that aid. Absolutely. Cuba is expecting full vaccination by the end of the year. Um, and again, if if in an ideal world um, where you didn't have these sanctions, you didn't have an economic blockade and the United States would simply just respect, um, you know, Cuba's political and economic model. Uh, in an ideal world, you know, the Western world and other allies would be able to help Cuba not only manufacture enough vaccines for their population, but also take their vaccines there because they have two vaccines, two protocols now that are have over 90 percent efficacy and be able to use that to send to other places as well. Um, but that's not what you have. You have the you have the opposite. You have the opposite. You have the United States continuing to to asphyxiate, asphyxi excuse me, uh, Cuba and uh, try to, you know, uh, strangulate Cuba into submission. Um, moving on to Mexico, um, I thought this was interesting. I mean, again, I, I always find AMLO to be an interesting figure. I, you know, I, um, while I'm personally supportive of AMLO, there's also, you know, parts of, um, there's also a lot to be said about, uh, about some of his decisions. But anyway, there was a, there's a piece here in, in Bloomberg um, and it, it, it's, uh, I'll read part, I'll read part of it. Uh, the title is Mexico presses on with plans to pay down debt using IMF funds. Uh, Mexico's president, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, Obrador said on Thursday, he'll seek central bank approval to use $12 billion in uh, IMF, uh, money reserves to pay down debt as he presses ahead with austerity. So, um, you know, that's, you know, um, he, and then there's a comment here. It says, you know, this is directly from AMLO. Uh, the money shouldn't just be stored away. That would be a loss because it earns very uh, little interest while the government has to pay high interest on its debt, um, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, I just, you know, the austerity stuff is uh, is something that's uh, that's interesting. Now, of course, you know, you know, they're, again, he had, you know, it's just for practical reasons, they're going to have to make certain business decisions. But, you know, I, I don't know if uh, austerity is the, the, the best uh uh, a best policy. Um, but uh, again, you know, um, he's the president. It, yeah. It might be interesting to see what, what they're cutting exactly. Like what, what program? Um, yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I just, uh, you know, I just saw, you know, this, and I, and I, it's not the first time that, you know, it's been mentioned where he's moving, but I, I, I agree. I would like to see a little bit more, more of the details. I, I haven't personally seen if any of, by the way, anybody at home, has any uh, additional information, please send it to us so we can look at it and analyze it. But, um, you know, um, but yeah, this, this is not the first time that the, that's been mentioned uh, that there's austerity uh, measures taking place in Mexico. Um, another thing, and we've covered this before, um, there is a, 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 the issue of the Mexican government uh, um, filing a lawsuit uh, in the United States against weapons manufacturer, arms manufacturers. Um, a US federal court has agreed to hear the, the litigation. Um, and so that's a step forward. The Mexican government is hailing this as a victory uh, in terms of just, you know, getting this moving along to the next step. Yeah. In, in Haiti, um, you know, we do have new numbers in. It uh, looks like nearly 2,000 dead and over 10,000 injured as a result of the recent earthquake. Um, I thought this was a very condescending. Uh, uh, th this is the next headline. The Biden administration is now taking a step back in its call for Haiti to have elections. And I saw that in a few headlines. And I think, again, it's just extremely condescending that somehow that the United States is determining, you know, um, you know, internal internal um, policy, you know, for, for Haiti. But, uh, right. you know, the, the Biden administration all of, all of a sudden now saying, well, because of all the, um, 
you know the with the, the recent crises with the with the with the earthquake and then now the flooding due to the, the the storms and whatnot you know let's 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 uh let's take a step back on pressuring haiti to to have elections as if somehow again it's almost acting like as a as a you know, as a you know neo colonial uh, actor so. they spent four years complaining about election interference and now they're right. just de they're deciding when other countries have their elections right right yeah. um now earlier in the week, uh, a P, you know, uh, I, I saw a, a piece here by by Reuters. Uh, U.S. has no current plans to deploy military in Haiti. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake S Sullivan stated, um, "But you, you um, Nick, uh, I know you you mentioned it. Uh, that apparently, they what two, was it two hundred troops or three hundred troops? Two hundred, yeah, U.S. Marines. Um, I could I, I could look again to see where it was reported exactly, but yeah, it was it was very recent." Um, and essentially it was for humanitarian efforts. Right, right. Um, yeah, here, so I th one place is, a, it's a lot of like uh, military magazines or military news outlets, um, as well as the, I think the US, USNI News. Um, but it's interesting because they, one of the things, the way they described it was the troops are moving, are, are withdrawing from Afghanistan and now some of those are being um, those who are withdrawn, who have been withdrawn from Afghanistan, are going to be shifted uh, uh, to Haiti. Um, and again, under the guise of humanitarian assistance. Uh, so it's it's interesting, you know, what this what this might turn into, because I think we've seen a lot of times that um, you know U.S. troop occupation leads to uh, prolonged occupation. You know, not just a few weeks or a few months, but years um so it's i i think it's inter i think it's you know really important but it's also something that's kind of getting uh not too much media attention right and actually you did send me the link so there it is yeah right there um moving right along in jamaica jamaica is under strict lockdown right now due to covid uh, night uh due to co a covid 19 surge jamaica's home to three million people over 1300 have died uh, due to COVID-19, more than 60,000 people have been infected and only 5% of the population is fully vaccinated. So we hope that, uh, you know, the hope that the in, uh, Jamaica conditions uh, start changing for, for the better soon. Um, moving right along to Venezuela. So this, this some news came out of Venezuela. I thought that, you know, definitely raised a lot of eyebrows. Initially, as, you know, when we, when we all read the headlines, we were like, okay, so where is he going? Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, we're talking about uh, Jorge Ariaza, Ariaza is out as foreign minister. Um, for folks watching at home, if you didn't know the name, um, you know, he was their foreign minister. He definitely uh, was someone who um, did a really good job of explaining uh, the Bolivarian Revolution, um, you know, here in the in the United States, um, we often met with different groups um, and, and, you know, talk to the American audience and try to, ex again, explain their process, explain their system, explain what's happening in Venezuela, explain what they want um, in terms of, um, you know, reestablishing relations with the, with the United States. Um, so he's out as foreign minister. His replacement is someone by the name of F uh, Felix. Uh, Placencia is his replacement. Uh, Placencia was uh, Venezuela's uh, Venezuela's envoy to China, and Ariaza has been reassigned to take over the Ministry of Industries and, and National Production, and attempts to sort of uh, you know uh, have the economy uh, boost up national you know overall national production. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I, I remember Ariaza from he did a lot of uh, his speeches in the UN were very. Uh, very good against in terms of standing up against u.s imperialism both in venezuela and, and and throughout the world i remember he did a good piece on uh syria too um defending the syrian government of assad so you know uh, it, you know it's good that they they end i guess they ended on good terms right is what we found right and uh it's good to see that there's still unity within the within the movement right um, no, so much so that I mean that's that's a pretty important position that they right. reassigned them to. It's not, you know, it's not like so. Um, you know, there there were other moves. Um, you know, we're just sort of highlighting, you know, the really, you know, the ones that were uh, that stood out. Um, you know, but there were other other moves that were, uh, you know, um, that were made by the uh, uh, Maduro administration in terms of you know shaking up his his um, his government. Um. 
On to the next piece, uh, Nicolas Maduro. President Nicolas Maduro is looking to reestablish diplomatic relations with U.S. Uh, via talks, the talks and meetings that are taking place in Mexico with the opposition. Um, this is, you know, for folks, um, you know, on on the on the so-called left, on the left here in the United States, we shouldn't view that as a negative thing. Again, you aspire towards an ideal. An ideal situation is that the empire would stop being an empire and stop fucking around in our countries, and you can you can have mutual respect and understanding. And so, this shouldn't be a surprise. The Cubans, for years, under the leadership of Fidel Castro, tried to normalize relations with the United States through backdoor channels and and whatnot. You don't want war, right? Regardless of what anybody may think of of, you know, and whatever your views are, you know, of of, of the Cubans uh, in terms of you know the Cuban Revolution or the uh, the Chavistas, the, the Sandinistas. These these countries don't want war. They don't want to be attacked. They want normal relations. They don't you know they don't want to be under constant on a constant pressure under constant attacks. Right. No, I mean, it's 100%. Um, you know, they, they, they are really, it's a position where you kind of have no choice, given just how, how global capitalism is and just how, how interconnected all these markets are. You have no choice but to engage, but to trade, but to have relations with uh, empires, with, you know, the United States, with Western Europe. Um, and that's, and, and, you know, the U.S. And, and the reason why sanctions are so uh, harmful is because, the U.S. and West and, and Europe understand that their economies are so large or so strong that other countries have to, you know, have some sort of relationship to it. And so by cutting off that relationship that, it, you know, that's why it's so it does so much damage to have these sanctions on these countries. And that's really, I think, you know, what what Cuba, what Venezuela are really that's that's the first step to normalizing relations is ending the sanctions. Right. That way they can actually start building an economy that's actually sovereign and not not limited absolutely absolutely uh, moving right along the uh, the the month the 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 talks i just we just mentioned and we've covered it we've been covering here every single week um the talks between the chavista government and the opposition will resume in september so just says uh, everybody sort of uh, uh stay tuned to see what happens um they they left the you know um the last meeting with sort of like um core principles and, 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 um, and certain, they call it, I think the memorandum of understanding is it called. And I think it was like nine or 10 points or something like that, that they agreed upon. Um, so that, that, that's a good thing. Um, the next headline, 19 U S house Democrats call for direct dialogue with the Chavista government and an end to, san an end to sanctions. They're also calling for an end to all U S financial and sectoral san sanctions. Um, this, I found this piece in at Venezuela analysis, uh, .com. um, I didn't really see this anywhere else. Um, if I'm, I may have missed it, but I didn't see it anywhere else. Um, it seems like insignificant, um, but I will. I will say this: um, I don't want to speak. <laughs> I don't ever want to speak on behalf of Latin America because I think they could do that themselves. But I think, I think it's it's safe to say that if that Latin American nations. Um, and Caribbean nations would gladly accept an end to empire and imperial machinations in in in, in Latin America and in the region. Um, so, whatever you may think of these nineteen House Democrats, and AOC was one of them, who's in there, and I have my I, I have my criticisms of of every single one of them. Um, if we were to somehow be able to get to a point. Where even under capitalism, this country would move away from empire and have actual normalized relations with all of our again, it, it's you know it's um, some some will argue that that's impossible given the 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 um, the nature of of of, of empire uh, that this thing's already entrenched right that you there's don't no, there's only one way to do that and that's to and maybe 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 you're right um, you know I, I would I. I probably would tend to agree with that. Nonetheless, I think that there's, I'm going to mention it again. I think that we need to figure out a way. When I say we, the, the American left needs to fit the so-called left needs to figure out a way to be smarter than what we, I mean, we, we suck at this game, like at this revolution game, like we just suck at it. Again, there's only two avenues 
And so how is it that we don't have more House of Representatives and more senators who are on our side? You know, and that's a question I'm just posing out there. You know, if again, if if our job is to create revolution, there's only two ways to do it. And and some will say, well, you can't compare the United States to Latin America. Um, and while I would agree with that on one end, I would say this, I will say this. What do you, th again, the bourgeoisie is in charge, the, the ruling, the capitalist ruling class is also in, in, in charge in Latin America. And like in a place like Dominican Republic, they're 100% in charge in other places as well. Um, you know, so it's, you have two, you have two choices. You only have two choices on how to get, um, take over, take over the state. And I think it's just something that we need to, to think about. Um, because, um, what, otherwise, what are we doing? We just talk, we keep saying the same things. You keep saying here, I keep hearing the same thing on, on YouTube and the left circle. Oh, we have to organize the masses. What the fuck does that mean? For what? To do what? Like, I need to, I need to be clear because I, you know, I need folks to be clear because I don't know what that means to organize the map. Clearly we have to organize the masses, but then to do what, you know? Um, and so it's just something I want to po pose out there, you know, just to, for folks, because, uh, it's just that the left here in the United States is just completely inept, completely. Right. Um, I haven't seen these these uh, Congress people who called uh, who called for this the end to the sanctions. My thing is this though: this isn't the first time they've called for sanctions to to be lifted off of Venezuela. Um, and it wasn't. It was only like what two two years ago. I remember Ilhan Omar was saying things like. You know, U.S. aid, U.S. humanitarian assistance is just military intervention. It's just a guise for military intervention. She said that, right? And, and she got praise from Telesur. She got praise from a lot of, like, left and progressive outlets. And then when a, a bill on, on giving money to, to a, a Venezuelan uh, humanitarian aid efforts came to the U.S. Congress, she voted for it. So... I think, you know, part of the problem that, that I have, that I think a lot of folks have with supporting them is that um, sometimes like a, a lot of the Congress people like AOC know exactly what to say and they they figure it out. And, you know, it's not even her herself. It's her team. Right. That campaign team she has behind her. They figured out exactly what people want to hear. They want to hear universal health care. They want to hear a uh, 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 minimum wage uh, increase in minimum wage. They want to hear you. You talk about these issues but you don't have to act on them. And so what we've seen is that like, you know, they, they talk about it, but they don't act on it. You know, and I agree with you that we got to figure out some way to like basically kind of consolidate our power or figure out what we're, what we're building for, what we're building to, right? What does it mean to organize the masses, right? Um, what does it mean to actually do these things or actually show solidarity or anti-imperialist action, right? And I think that's the easiest place for most people to start is to start with issues like these, like ending the sanctions, ending war. Why, why isn't there any uh, uh, broad and united anti-imperialist front in the United States that just focuses on these very simple issues of, of fighting sanctions, fighting wars? Um, you know, that's that's the easiest place for the, for the left to start. Um, but the part I'm, of the- Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say part of the problem though is a lot of people are co-opting that language, but not acting on it, right? Um, and that, that's kind of, I feel, I feel like a lot of, like a lot of the times whenever they talk about wanting to end sanctions or wanting to end the war, like they, they say that, and it, it is good that you say that, but like, what, what are you going to do? What, what kind of policy or legislation are you going to bring up to Congress to force them to do that? You know, I'm going to say it again. We need a revolutionary Vanguard party <laughs> by that's, that's led by our people. I'm going to be more specific people of color. You know what I mean? Like black and brown folks, indigenous folks. And it can't, I'm sorry, white folks. Like, yeah, you know, if this is the best you got to offer, like th then we, we got to go all the way back to the sixties to see some real shit. The Malcolm X's, the black Panthers, the young Lords like that. So until we figure that out, um, that, this is a failure of the left as a failure of, of all of us really. I mean, so, but that's just, you know, and then, you know, some folks may, may, Take everything I'm saying is, wait, aren't you a third worldist? Yeah, but I, you know, like I am a third worldist, 100. percent And I've never said that we shouldn't stop with that. We just stop doing whatever we. Like, who's this is this is what other people say about us that we somehow don't want to do anything here. No, other people are saying that. What we're saying is that uh, it's clear and obvious that 
our Latin American revolution, the Latin American revolution that's happening right now needs 100% support, needs solidarity, and they have more revolutionary capacity than the folks here in the United States. There's no contradiction in me saying that and me saying that we need to you know, have a revolutionary movement here in the United States, ideally led by us, because I think that's because we have, again, I'm going to just say it, I think we have the most revolutionary potential. You know, other people don't feel that way. They'll be like, oh, the working class. What working class are you talking about? People, I've heard people say this, the proletariat, the proletariat, that proletariat class. Well, let's be specific about that language, right? Because in, by Marxist definition, you're speaking about a particular sector. You're speaking about the industrialized um, worker who's involved in um, the actual means of production, actual production. What the fuck is the United States producing? What do yeah. what what factories are we taking over? Right. It's a service sector economy. So you don't have a proletariat here in the United States. It's a service sector economy. You have a working class. You have a working class. But this idea, oh, the proletariat. The pro what what factories? All these factories. What what what, what are we, ma we manufacturing? What are we? What how many people are in construction? I'm not saying that that, that doesn't exist, but it's a it's a small sector of the, of, of, the, of the economy. It's not it's not what it used to be. Right. And two, you got to think about just on the topic, like how manufacturing has changed. Wages usually in manufacturing, like actual like factory jobs are pretty, uh, pretty much higher than like in retail or service sector or anything like that. Um, or like even like day laborers, construction, like manu actual manufacturing jobs are uh, usually pay pretty well, you know. <laughs> so it's like not even like the, the working class, not even like the bottom of the bottom, but it's it's dogmatism right it's people stuck in old ways of thinking um and and again like if we could have our own party imagine so like right now they have this this uh i think a bill that's going through through congress and senate like the rubio johnson bill about cuba about getting cuba free access to internet right if you had poli like like even like liberal or progressive politicians who were at least supportive of an anti-imperialist front or anti-imperialist policies they could fight against that bill. But I guarantee you this bill is going to get passed unanimously because almost every foreign policy bill that, that goes to the U.S. Congress gets passed unanimously. Right. It'll get passed unanimously because there is no there is no political force that's fighting like, you know, against sanctions or, or for uh, against or I'm sorry, against the empire for anti-imperialism. Nick, I want I want to thank you because I'm going to call an audible here and I'm going to go back to Cuba. I totally missed one of the headlines. And so I thank you for bringing that up because this is important. This was a this was big news. Decree 35 in Cuba. Cuba implements a new law targeting those promoting fake news, misinformation, cyber lies um, and content which would, quote unquote, uh, incite mobilizations or other acts that upset public order. Again, I say good for Cuba because Cuba is seeing what's happening, um, right, with what took place on July 11th, with what you just mentioned, which is all over the news, by the way. This is all, 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 since July 11th. This, this has been a big push by these by these imperial um, uh, legislators to say we need to get free access of, to, in, of Internet to Cuba. They're pushing. This is a big thing. Why is that? Why is that? Because this is this is a way to very just very sneakily, you know, get, get into these, um, basically infiltrate, you know, and take advantage of, of of the situation for those who may, you know, feel a certain type of way right now because of the economic conditions, the material conditions that exist in Cuba. So the empire is saying we got to give those people free internet access. Well, that, that's not because they really care about free internet access. They don't give a fuck about that. This is a way, another act of war. To, to be able to spread misinformation and lies and try to win over some folks who may be a little discontent and whatnot. And Cuba saying, no, 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 we're going to have, we're going to have a new law in the books. Um, and by the way, they're not even p that punitive. Like you're not going to go to jail for this stuff. They're just going to, they're, they're basically regulatory. Um, so people are freaking out over this shit, you know, and then the West is pick plucking out quotes here and there like, Oh, you can't even talk in Cuba now, this, that, and that. It, no one's going to jail, you know, like there's at least not yet. And I, by the way, I'm one to say that you should go to jail for that. If you are promoting fake news, if you're going to be fomenting, you know, um, uh, civil disobedience and, and uh, you know, riots and stuff like that and causing all types of on behalf of another country, on behalf of another country, you should go to jail. That's treasonous. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, for me, it really depends on who's in power, who, who are, who's the, the class in power. 
Um, because a lot of people is this is this big thing in 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 among liberals and among uh social democrats, I only and like progressives, I only bring this up because you know a lot of people may uh be coming over like to watch our program from that, like that ideology. And there's a, a thinking that's like we need freedom for everyone. You know, like a, a big talking point is freedom of speech or freedom of uh, freedom of the press, like they were talking about in Nicaragua. None of that, none of that shit's really real, right? That's all. That's all bullshit, right? It, it, freedom of speech, in my, like in my opinion, honestly doesn't exist. You have the U.S. censors all kinds of media. Look at, the, I, and I always point to this. Look at press TV from Iran. I don't know how many times the U.S. has shut down their YouTube page, shut down all of their social media page, shut down their entire website um, because they classified it as, you know, a funding or being a, a, an appendage of a terrorist state. So, you know, there's no such thing as free free press or free media. It's all about who's in power, who gets to determine what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. And if we're being honest, if we had socialist in power, if we were in power, there are things that that we that are so uh, uh, false or like so. Uh, and, and it's not just that it's fake news, but it's fake news that has then has an impact on on people and, and ha- you know makes things happen materially like counter-revolutionary protests. Those things need to be banned, right? And I, you know, I, I would agree with you. Not only do they need to be banned, but the people who, who, who spread them need to, uh, or at least start the rumors, need to be prosecuted, right? Need to be, uh, they need to be actual political exiles. I'm just thinking about all these folks who are going to be coming from Cuba, who are going to be right-wing counter-revolutionaries, who are you know, maybe from the island, who are from Havana, whatever, now have access to the internet. Aren't, aren't going to be getting arrested by the Cuban government, but are going to be coming to the U.S. and then claiming that they're political exiles, just like the guy, uh, Paparazzi. Um, it's going to be the same shit, right? And it's probably going to be in the next coming years like a, a, a influx of just a bunch of those types of people. Absolutely. And, and um, there was a quote in one of the pieces um, regarding this decree, thir- um, what was it, decree 35, I believe it's called, um, where they said, look, we're, 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 all we're saying is that, um, yeah, the 35, all we're saying is that, again, like Fidel has said many times within the revolution, you can say whatever you want. It's if you're, if you're coming, if you're, if you're levying criticism from a revolutionary perspective, or e- even if you, tu eres uno de esos que piensa diferente, or the people who think differently, that's what they call, that's what, how the term that they use in Cuba. They're okay with that. As long as you're not advocating for violence, as long as you're not advocating for the overthrow of the Cuban gov- of the Cuban government, as long as you're not advocating uh, for some sort of civil war, um, as long as you're not advocating for capitalism, you know they're okay with people levying criticism, you know, of the government, of society, of anything that's happening in Cuba. What they what they won't accept is crop counter revolutionary activity, uh, subversive activity, people trying to um, again. Uh, foment violence or, or civil war in, in, in the country. Again, Cuba is a peaceful, peaceful, peaceful nation. Like <laughs> within the international stage and within Cuba, there, there's not there's not much violence that happens in Cuba. So the Cubans are, are expecting that their citizenry behave accordingly. Like this is this is a safe country. We want it to continue to be safe. Levy your criticism. This is this is what's um uh, this is what's acceptable within these parameters. Anything outside those parameters, this is what you know. This is the uh, potential consequences. People should be held accountable. Right. Um, you know, here I just want to give you know. You mentioned something about that. You know, uh, you mentioned that there there is the freedom of speech is an illusion. This is these are nice words that the Western your world likes to use: freedom, democracy, all these nice, cute words, which you know have very vague definitions. Like nobody could really explain these things. Um, here at, at Anti Conquista, just so folks know, we we have conversations behind closed doors about like, okay, so what if our Twitter gets shut down, or what if our Instagram shut down? Like, we have to actually have those conversations because we're constantly worried. We see we see what what's happened with other folks, um, and other folks getting banned uh, on social media. Um, we're constantly worried about that. So, what freedom of speech are we are people talking about when we're seeing other accounts on the left, um, even with other groups that we don't necessarily even agree with all the time, but we're in solidarity with them in the sense that, like, they deserve to have their space. And again, it really it's uh, it's like George Carlin said, you know, rights 
rights are just a thing. They don't really exist. It's all about, it's like you said, it's all about power. Who's in power? Who doesn't have power? Yeah. Right. And so when you're not in power, <laughs> when you're not in power, you know, we can, we can say, woe is me. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, damn this capitalist imperialist system. They took away my social media. Uh, th- it doesn't matter. They're in power. They get to do right. whatever the fuck they want. You know, they're going to protect their interests. Right. Just like the Cuban revolution and the uh, the Cuban revolutionaries are going to protect their interests. They're going to protect their system. It's the same thing. And they're in the right to do so. Right. And yeah, it's justified. And I think, too, it's, it's you know, on, just on the topic real quick, it's kind of ridiculous then to like to try to fight this single issue of freedom of speech rather than focusing on the fight for power. Because you really want to change. You want, really want to like stop yourself from getting banned or censored or whatever. OK, take power. Now, now you get to choose. Or like now, it's not even you specifically, but it's the the who do you represent? Which class do you represent? The elite, you know, the rich, the millionaires, the billionaire, or do you or do you represent you know the actual working class, the the migrant laborers, the campesinos? Or, you know, which side which side do you stand for? Right. Yeah, you and I have had plenty of conversations. Uh, I think we made it that right. disclosed this uh, publicly, but we we we're, pro- we're probably going to do a whole episode on power. What is power? How to define power? What it looks like? Um, why you shouldn't be afraid of the word, um, you know. So, um, yeah, this question of power is something that we should definitely uh, tackle head on on, a, on another another program because uh, it's something that people have a hard time conceptualizing or even or even even ever bringing it up. It's like again, people get caught up in these very cute words, <laughs> you know, and it's because we've been we've been indoctrinated with this Western, you know, liberal thinking, you know, of like, oh, this is you know, democracy and freedom and human rights and civil rights and all, you know, it's like, how do you define some of this stuff? What does that mean? And what does that look like? Right. And some people are afraid of, of, you know, hierarchical organizations of of authoritarian organizations, but to some extent, and I think we, we all agree here, you, you need, you need some of that, right? There's a, there's a reason why we have these things, not all the time, not in every space depends on the context, but some cases you need that kind of, uh, uh, powerful of like centralized leadership um that's and that's what's created successful socialist nations that's how that's what made cuba so successful as successful it is as it is today and that's another topic we need to discuss within that as a maybe right. su- as a subtext or sub uh, thing but uh because uh you know you hear this a lot on the so-called left here in the united states it's like oh we don't want to create a vertical you know right. a vertical structure like what like it works I don't know why. Why would you be against creating something that works? And the the, the kickback or the the retort to that is to, uh, typically like, well, you know, that's how this country has, uh, you know, that's how the system has been able to, you know, take wipe out its leaders because it it figures out who the leader. But you need leadership. You know, what I mean, you can't you you can't um, yeah. this idea that you can't that you know you're going to create this uh, leadership, you know, uh, horizontal structure where everybody's. It, Show me, so show me where that's that model has ever taken over state power. I just tell me, tell me where. All right, All right. No, it's, <laughs> it it's, doesn't work. Right, yeah, yeah, and it's 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 crazy to me just how popular. I mean, it's mostly popular amongst like liberals, anarchists, and stuff. But right, a lot of young people, yeah, a lot of young people buy into that, and you know, I it makes sense as like because how they were taught history, taught history that all these organizations were oppressive. They had their own flaws and contradictions. But it's like that that's true for everything. That's gonna be true for your horizontal organization too. <laughs> right. Right, right. It's true everywhere. Right. Right. And I think what what happens is that people just have a hard time, a couple things. Um, we often do like to be the cacique, the guy, the the the, the head person in charge, but we don't like to take orders. Right. And that is a problem. That is a problem because we all need to. I've been in. I've been in both, man. I've been. I've been. I've been a leader, um, you know, where I've had to tell other people like, "Hey, this is what I expect to be done," so on and so forth. And and those things could be dialectical. You know, there's a you create protocol for that. Um, you know, where you can be challenged. But I've also been a follower, if you will, uh, you know, or let's say a good soldier within a a good strong organization. And my job was to be like, when they told me, yo, big, I need you to jump. How high, bro? I got you. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you, if you believe in the movement, if you believe in the organization, if you believe in your leaders, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think people have a hard time, especially here in the, in the, 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 the United States, people have a hard time 
with taking orders. Um, and, and it's just, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's problematic. It's very, very problematic because everybody, everybody wants to be the cacique. Everybody. Right. No, nah, that's, I think it's good that you mentioned that. That's completely true. Like I, I and it's, it's crazy too. Cause usually it's those who are taking orders that make the movement. You know, if they, if there yes. wasn't millions and millions of people who actually supported Fidel and Che, they wouldn't have gotten anywhere, right? They would have been in jail and, and executed by Batista. But it was because they had that that people, that mass support, that rank and file support of people who were willing to do anything to support the revolution, right? They were going to die for the revolution. They were going to die for Fidel and shit. That's what made the country, and that's what made the party what it is. 100%. 100%. And you get, it's, it's just a, a, a an excellent, excellent, excellent point. Because anybody who's been in a position of leadership, you know, and I've, and I've said this to people in, in rooms that I can't. You know, my what our roles, they're they're just different. That's all it is. My role is not more important than your role. Your role is not more important than my role. They're just different. And in fact, you know, even though I have this title of whatever in this specific organization, I can't we can't do anything if you if you if you folks don't empower me and 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 um aren't buttressing the work that we're doing collectively. Like if you're not, you know, so it's like people miss that. It's like, there's so much power in being a, a good soldier. There's so much power in that. Right. You right. know, anyways. Um, so continuing on, we got, we got off topic here, but, uh, that, that was okay. I think that was, it was, I think it was important. Um, just a little time check where now we're in 20 minutes. So let's see if we can wrap up within the next 15 minutes or so. Um, another interesting thing that I came across, um, uh, op ed piece published in the Hill, by war criminal Elliot Abrams, uh, who weighs in on the Venezuela, providing a list of do's and don'ts, including backing uh, the talks and outcomes of the no negotiations taking place in Mexico. Uh, he's adamant that the Biden administration not lose sight of the importance of Venezuela. So here you have a war criminal, um, Elliot Abrams. I strongly, again, uh, I, I read a lot of capitalist press. Um, I often say they will reveal themselves to you. Um, they will tell you exactly what they're thinking, what their what their next moves are going to possibly be. Um, so I strongly encourage folks to to read Elliot Abrams' piece um, that's uh, published in the Hill. Again, this guy's a disgusting human being. Um, he should be in jail for the rest of his life, uh, but instead he's free, uh, writing about Venezuela. Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, and this is what they do, right? Right after they leave office, now they get all of these deals with media, uh, whether it be on TV or through newspaper or through press. And it's, it comes right off the back of them, you know, uh, supporting bombings, invasions, sanctions, killing thousands of people. It's pretty insane. But that's, it's, it's normalized now in the U.S. He should be in jail for the rest of his life for genocide, for, for, for his, for, for, He's responsible for literally thousands of people being of dying in 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 uh, Central America. I mean, the guy is just a disgusting human being. He's just you know. But anyways, but but check out his piece. He's he's free and alive, uh, and writing writing pieces now for for the Hill. Um, in Bolivia, um, this was this was um, if folks weren't, I, I caught part parts of this. I, I had to stop watching because I I got very emotional listening to some of these testimonies. But the, uh, in Bolivia, the interdisciplinary group of independent experts released a report on what took place after the 2019, uh, 2019 right wing coup. Uh, gross human rights violations were reported, as at least thirty eight people were killed, hundreds seriously uh, injured. Some were uh, summary uh, executions. Others were reported to be tortured by state security forces, and the Añez government gave cover to these state-sponsored abuses under the auspices of a, of a decree, decree number 4078, which state, is, uh, st uh, state security forces exempt from all criminal responsibility. Um, and so um, the, and I, I know I'm going to probably screw up the name, uh, the, the pronunciation of, again, Causa uh, Chung, Causa Chung News, was um, and by the way, the, the president President Arce was there. But Bolivian President Arce was 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 there during some of these presentations and the testimonies uh, given. Um, there are measures that are going to be taken to try to hopefully bring people to justice and uh, some sort of reconciliation on behalf of the state. He apologized on behalf of the state, even though he was obviously President Arce had nothing to do with this. Um, and so, 
uh, it was just it was just gut wrenching just just to hear some of these testimonies and hear some of the moms you know talk about what would happen to their sons and and whatnot. Um, so I don't know if they still have it on their. I was watching on Facebook. I don't know if they still have it. I'm presuming they probably still have it posted on their Facebook. Um, but you could, if you folks wanted to check out the uh, some of the testimonies um, from this report um, that that emanated from this report. Um, you know, uh, you could check that out at Causa Chung News. So, real, real quick, just on Bolivia, we did a, I, well, I did a, a, a an anti conquista maybe two years ago or a year ago. Um, we uh, spoke with some of the uh, some of, my, of uh, some comrades of mine who went to Bolivia. Were there during the coup and, and right before the coup, and uh, they talked about some of the uh, uh, massacres that had occurred and in some of the communities how they were affected. A lot of social activists, a lot of union activists, a lot of uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, campesinos and, and um, you know social leaders were you either tortured, beaten, arrested, uh, mur ma uh, massacred, you know murdered, um, and this was all in the span of the you know the cool government only lasted for one year right and i think it, it's it's a good um i think it's a good reflection of what what's going to happen if these right-wing opposition parties take power right it's 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 going to be a bloodbath it's it's they want to not only uh you know distance the opposition in this turn in this, in this case the the progressive the social democrat or socialist they don't want to just distance them from politics they want to completely eradicate them from politics right um, in that interview, you know, we spoke with uh, uh, Pambana, who went to uh, Bolivia, and they spoke with uh, uh, Afro um, Afro Bolivian uh, political leader Elena Flores, who was arrested on the false charges of of robbery. Um, and so, you know, it's political activists like this. She just led a, all she did was a, a, a led a, she led a union of coca farmers in Bolivia, right? She wasn't, you know, she was pro mas, but she wasn't super uh, uh, active outside of organizing for her for her union um but once the coup government came in they immediately came after her right because she was fighting for Evo Morales she was fighting for Moss um and it's it's stuff like that that's concerning which is why we fight so hard against you know organize why we fight so hard against uh, Guaido and uh, all of the right wing uh, Venezuelan opposition the Peruvian opposition which is threatening Castillo now um you know these folks want to kill they actually want to kill uh, uh our our people right they they want to kill these parties and individuals i got a i got a taste of of what being a revolutionary activist in latin america um or the caribbean was and when i was out there in 2006 i was a member of frente de lucha jesuli plan which was named after a revolutionary that was gunned down in the city of navarrete i was in navarrete for about i always forget it was like seven or eight months or something like that as an active member of of Reju. Um, and then for folks who know a little bit about Dominican politics, there's Freju and then there's, uh, there's Falpo, um, that's Falpo's nationwide, Freju is based out of uh, Navarrete. And I got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a taste of what that, that is like. And, and, you know, um, it's just, it's wild. Um, you know, while I was out there, yeah, it, it, it happened. Uh, um, someone by the name of Oni, I always, I, I, I forget his name. Uh, full name, but uh, Oni, who was a member of, of Falpo, was um, was killed by um, by a, a local police officer. He was assassinated. And I was with Oni the night, the night, hours before he was assassinated. I was with him, um, literally, like right next to him. We were part of a, a, a community meeting um, up in the mountains, and um, you know, um, with a. You know, they had asked for the for for the groups to go up there and try to resolve one of their issues, and I was well, I I woke up to gunshots um, all over just all over the place, and I immediately called our leader and I said, "What's the heck's going on?" Uh, he said, "Just come meet us at you know the normal spot," and um, it was a whole week's worth of um, of uh, let's just say um you know an interesting situation uh, between the revolutionary groups and state security forces um and this is you know mind you i was out there for what seven eight months i saw that happen you know and and i just heard all the stories of all these young revolutionary uh mostly young young boys um young men um getting gunned down left and right you know um, by state security forces so this that's Dominican Republic imagine 
all these other kind that's 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 what happens that's what happens you know um it's um it's just it's crazy and so you have this report folks can look it up um and it's um you know it's just again just to hear some of these testimonies and whatnot was uh, pretty gut-wrenching um moving moving along um Apparently, uh, former President coup plotter uh, Janine Añez, again, we're sticking with Bolivia, is attempting suicide while in prison. Uh, her health is deteriorating. Uh, she's attempting, uh, apparently she's attempting suicide and her uh, attorney is advocating for her. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, she could commit suicide. That's, that's perfectly fine uh, by me. Um, in Brazil, uh, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has his lowest approval rating to date while Lula continues, Lula da Silva, former president of uh, Brazil, continues to lead in polls if a presidential election were to take place today. Um, so again, it's just not looking good for, for Jair Bolsonaro. Yeah, um, yeah I, you know, it's going to be, that's another interesting election to follow because he's a guy who, and we've mentioned this a lot of times before, he admires the 1950s, 1960s Brazilian military dictatorship. He admires like sh explicit, straight up fascist dictatorship um, and military power and control. So what's he going to do when or if he loses the next election? Right. Is he how is he going to give up power? Um, and what's you know, uh, the U.S. has already met with him once um, to discuss the election. So what's you know, what's the U.S. role going to be? Yeah, we've been covering that every week here, and um, so we're going to keep a close eye to, uh, on on that. But he's done. He's he's already setting setting it up where he's, um, um, you know, uh, questioning the already on uh, the legit legitimacy of the of the. I mean, we haven't even had the elections yet, and he's already questioning uh, the integrity of the voting system and saying that the only way he's going to he's going to lose or other people are saying this on, on his behalf uh, especially trumpistas um actual trumpistas are saying that um uh the only way he's going to be able to lose or is going to lose if is if there's a voter fraud so they they're using that playbook and uh, we mentioned it last week uh you know the, the whole Steve Bannon connection and and now Trump's son um you know there's con there's a connection there so uh, yeah it's um it you, we have to keep an eye on, on Brazil. It's a, it's a large economy. Um, you know, and so, um, we, we, we gotta be, we gotta be vigilant. Yeah. Uh, Argentina. So in Argentina, uh, the economy has rebounded more than expected. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit quick here. Um, um, just because of, of time. Um, so there's a piece in, in Bloomberg, um, and you know, folks can check that out. Um, you know, their, their, their economy seems to be doing, okay under under i hate to say it's a it's a you know they're not socialists i guess they're peronistas um i guess probably the best way to to describe um but but nonetheless you know we'll we'll, we'll take it right um and then you know um it looks like for sure president Mac macri former president macri um uh, took part in some arms struggling um, smuggling to bolivia to to help with the 2019 um um coup in Bolivia, so there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff, a lot of documents coming out, trying to put the pieces together to figure out who who was involved, how did it happen, uh, so on and so forth. So we we've been covering that here week to week. Um, in Peru, this was this was interesting. I really encourage folks to again, if again, as I've stated before, the capitalist press will often, um, you know, reveal themselves to you in, in terms of what their intentions are. Um, in Peru. Uh, the Peru minister resigns after suggesting Shining Path rebels had CIA uh, support. Um, and so this this caused, um, and we're talking, give me a second here. Uh, we're talking under another than uh, he, uh, Hector Behar, uh, 85 years old. Um, and so read, go to The Guardian. Uh, the Guardian had a piece there. And, it, you know, I what I took away from that piece as soon as I read it was like, this is not going to stop. Like, this is just the, the attacks on Peru are just, they're not going to stop. They're not really going to stop until they can figure out a way to get Castillo out of, remove him out of power completely. Um, but definitely for folks, you know, at home, check that, check that piece out. Um, I guess it's, um, Reuters, it's, it's a Reuters piece that was published on, on the guardian, but, um, I'm not sure if you wanted, wanted to add anything to that. I mean, yeah, the, the, so we, I agree. Like, again, they're going to be coming after Castillo. They already have been, 
Um, but I think the main way we're going to see a lot of these attacks play out is through the parliament because there's a lot of right wing opposition figures that still have power in the parliament. I think the majority actually are still are not uh, part of uh, Peru Libre. So they're not part of Castillo's party. Um, and so he's going to have a, and they have to be the ones who are going to confirm the ministers uh, who are going to be part of his cabinet and his administration. So it's going to be tough, um, you know, to, to, to really push through maybe some of the more left wing um, ministers. It'll be interesting to see how that works out, what alliances they make or what, if they have to make any compromises. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of it's going to come down to how, how much are they going to dole Castillo, right? How much are they going to dole the, uh, the, the, or, or kind of like nullify the left or the radicalism that may come out of his, of his administration or leadership, right? Cause they're going to try to put in moderates. They're going to try to force him to pick, you know, maybe conservatives, um, and it, it'll be tough. It'll be an uphill battle, but, uh, you know, hopefully it just stays. I, I think it would be better if that all stays parliamentary and doesn't end up in like, uh, uh, you know, like a coup, like we saw in Bolivia. Right. right and Bolivia, I, I think it's, I, that's the part that I fear. And I think, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, I mean, if, if, if you're just analyzing this from, from, from which was what we are, what we are doing, um, I, it looks like, the the right is is essentially organizing for a coup like i don't i don't see them stopping until they get they remove them out of power they're saying as much they're saying as much so you have to take them for the word and remember he won by a slim margin right remember that uh the 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 um the wealthy the powerful they're the 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 wealthy the capitalist ruling class so the bourgeoisie if you will um uh not if you will but the, the bourgeoisie is essentially in power of all state institutions so again it, this this is this was just like a baby step there um in, in peru um it's not it's not venezuela it's not nicaragua it was just a little baby step inching towards something right um um and so it's it's um retired generals also speaking out against castillo so yeah i mean look it's it they're not going to stop they're not going to stop and so um you know hopefully you know castillo uh, figures out a way to um you know the 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 idea of calling for, I believe he's calling for a plebiscite for, um, to redo the constitution. I think that would be a great step. Any, anything he can do to, to try to create, um, you know, um, you know, alter an alternative power, um, through, you know, creating new institutions and whatnot. I think that'll help, but it's, it's a, it's a baby step that, you know, his, his next step would be the, again, the constitution, redoing the constitution and getting more people elected to, um, um, to the legislative body from their from their political party right right um moving over to moving on to and i think this is going to be the last piece I'll, I'll i'll just for the sake of time um so let me let me pull this one up and and i think we'll end here as always we appreciate the audience we appreciate everybody tuning in and again please share this with 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 folks um here it is uh this is uh, again a reuters piece, um, but it was published on at, uh, U.S. News. Uh, Colombia extradites ELN rebel fighters to U.S. for first time. Uh, for, for the first time, Colombia on Thursday extradited two alleged members of the National Liberation Army, or ELN, who are accused by U.S. federal court of drug, drug trafficking. Extradition is one of the toughest tools Colombia and its allies use to combat the production and distribution of cocaine. Uh, the Andean country, under constant pressure from the United States to reduce production of coke, coca and, and cocaine, has sent hundreds of its citizens north over the past three decades to face drug charges, including members of the now demobilized FARC rebels and paramilitary gangs. Um, and, you know, just has a few other things here. So the ELN, former FARC members who reject the 2016 peace deal and crime gangs formed by, uh, by former right-wing paramilitaries are all involved in drug trafficking in Colombia, where a nearly six-decade conflict has killed over you know 250,000 uh, people. Uh, the ELN, which st still has some 2,500 fighters in its class as a terrorist organization by the U.S. and European Union, has previously denied involvement in the drug trade, but has admitted coca cultivations and cocaine labs are present in areas where it operates. Um, and so, you know, this is just something to keep an eye on. You know, um, Cuba has, is 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 still on a list of states state sponsoring terrorism because um, they they have hosted um, 
and continue to host ELN uh, members to um, in, in the similar way that Mexico is having conversations uh, or uh, hosting conversations between uh, the Chavistas and the opposition. Uh, Cuba is doing the same in Cuba with the ELN and um, and, and members of the state of, of Colombia and, and Cuba is being punished by by um, simply simply uh, simply for doing that. Um, so just just to, you know, we, anything that comes up in the news with with regards to the FARC and the ELN, we definitely want to just keep an eye on. Um, um, Nick, any any thoughts on that before we we end, or any thoughts on anything else? No, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, as terms of that, that always reminds me of the the argument that you know the U.S. doesn't have political prisoners. It's very much the war on drugs and all this stuff is very much a political fight. Um, and we see that through the propaganda against the ELN, against the FARC, uh, oftentimes comparing them to the right wing paramilitaries who are usually funded by the, the Colombian government or the U.S. government. Uh, so it's two very different things. But, you know, these there are this is a political war um, and it's it's you know, it has uh, it leads to these, you know, sorts of political prisoners. Right. That that occur. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I think. Overall, just just looking back on, on what we were talking about today, the first part of the discussion about NGOs in Latin America, I think, is important because at the end of the day, this is going to be the new kind of wave of imperialism that's going to be assaulting a lot of our uh, a lot of our, our homelands, a lot of our peoples. Um, and it's not like I think you made a good point. It's not just in Latin America that this is going to be happening. It's also going to be happening here in the diaspora where these NGOs, these nonprofits are going to exist everywhere in order to kind of lead our people astray and really like dull or, or blunt that revolutionary knife and stop that radicalization. Um, and, you know, we've seen we've seen them really do divide and conquer tactics with the indigenous communities, with black communities, with women. Right. With, uh, 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 you know, the middle classes, even um, we didn't get to touch on this too much, but like with labor unions going into uh, being formed by the United States, being funded uh, by USAID and targeting like skilled workers in, in a certain Latin American country. And that really separates them from the rest of the working class, right? So all of these different NGO movements who claim to be helping our people, helping our communities, and are really just devastating them, exploiting them, profiting off of the poverty and, and, and oppression. Um, and not only that, but then fighting against you know, governments like uh, the Mas government in Bolivia, fighting against uh, uh, Maduro in Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution, fighting against Ortega and, and the Sandinistas, right? Um, this is going to be the new wave of struggle that, that we have to wage. And it's going to be different than the conservative struggle, which is straight up war, military intervention. This is going to be the, the struggle against liberals and progressives, which is uh, under this guise of humanitarian assistance or aid or caring about uh, uh, oppressed classes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, well put. I, I don't uh, have anything else to add to that. Um, I think it's probably best we're going on an hour and almost 45 minutes. Um, as always, to the audience, uh, again, we thank you. Um, this is Anticonquista. Catch us at anticonquista.com. Um, again, please like, please share, please subscribe. Um, and we are on all social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth. So um, to the folks watching at home, we appreciate you folks. Uh, consider donating to to Anti Conquista. Again, um, we're 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 not a non for profit organization. <laughs> we don't we don't uh, profit off of this stuff. None of this money that you donate to us goes into our pocket. We 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 donate uh, that money to to uh, revolutionary progressive uh, organizations and groups in in Latin America. So. Um, and up to date, we've we've donated over a hundred thousand dollars. So the last group we donated to um, is a group, uh, a political party in the Dominican Republic, uh, La Fuerza de la Revolución. Um, and so, yeah, we uh, also, oh, real quick, we also just recently gave money to the uh, Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. Oh, that's right. And um, donated some money there for the earthquake. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, we appreciate you, folks. Um, you know, we'll, we'll catch you. Yeah, we'll catch you again um, next week. All right. Take care. Definitely. Have a good one.